Uh, so we're, we're, we're looking at religious abuse. This is the second week that we're doing this. Um, these are things that have driven uh, my generation away from church, things that really have to be discussed. I'm definitely not trying to give easy answers to these things. I'm just trying to give more of a um, wider understanding about them. We'll talk more about solutions and moving forward um, at the end of the thing. Part of the problem that I've noticed, though, is that a lot of my generation doesn't actually want to talk how to fix the problem they just want to kind of complain about it and give it as a reason to not get into church so if you say something like um uh my church isn't like that first off it, they'll they'll just kind of see that as kind of like you're not really listening another thing is they'll kind of see that as you're just trying to excuse it rather than address it and it's like i definitely understand where they're coming from but it makes it very hard to talk about this in such a way where, we, where you can move forward and give answers because they're not interested in moving forward and giving answers they just want you to listen to them which brings me to another thing that i neglected to bring up last week um the church has neglected mental health for a long time um and has especially the last generation has been very judgmental and not accepting of people that are in certain kinds of sins so some things um we're kind of having to paddle upstream, if you will, and uh, some things that people deal with, um, they're, they're not really natural. It's not really a natural progression of a healthy mind and spirit. So in, rather than focusing on trying to love the person and try to help the person, sometimes we focused over much on the sin itself. And uh, I mean, like for instance, homosexuality, right? Okay, well, yes, it's bad. Yes, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you on that, but. The overwhelming majority of homosexuals are people who have, you know, have had these traumatic experiences, poor relationships with their fathers, these different things. And it's like, well, so which – if somebody gets shot, would you try and put a Band-Aid over the bullet wound to try and get the – to close up? Or would you try to take the bullet out first and then worry about getting – see what I mean? And I feel like the church kind of has – and this is why it makes it so hard to have this conversation because the church has already decided, well, the Bible says it's a sin. And I'm not disagreeing. The Bible does say it's a sin. But if you don't try to rectify the problem, you're going to continue to have the symptoms. And one of the biggest problems that our culture is facing right now is a lack of fathers. And that lack of fathers is causing a lot of hurt people with hurts, hurts, wounded spirits. And it's causing a lot of things that are the, not the natural progression of things. It is natural for a boy to look at a girl and go, ho, oh, haba. That's that's normal. That's a completely natural process. And um, so homosexuality and S&M, that kind of stuff, it, it's, it, it's a symptom of, of an ill individual, and we should be loving and supportive, but the sin is not acceptable. And realize you can't change people. No matter how good your arguments are, you can't change somebody. Only God can change somebody. So you can love them, but don't love them for the sake of them changing um and uh, one thing that i also have to say on this before we get going into the actual topic for tonight is that the people you work the longest with will yield you the least results um it let me put it like this it's kind of like t tending a crop right there's there's a natural growth that happens when you water a seed and it develops into a vegetable and then you harvest it and then you eat it and that's that's a normal process and uh, – but the thing is is the plant actually has to grow. I remember once I had this vegetable that was not – it was not going to make it, and I was trying to make it make it. So I, I kept babying the thing as much as I could to get it to, to do something, and it just – it did, that didn't happen. It, 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 it didn't work. It, you know, but what happened is I kept it alive all throughout the growing season, but it never produced anything. See, I was trying to do the work of it growing for it, but – Unless it had, unless it got its natural process, it wasn't gonna, it wasn't gonna do it. And I, what I'm trying to say is, is when you're helping somebody, if they don't want to grow and if they don't actually put forth the work of growing, you can't carry them. You can't make somebody grow. And so when you're, when you're dealing with stuff like this, it's important to remember: listen to people who are disgruntled. Don't try and win the argument, but also don't compromise truth. In your in yourself, so what what happens is we start dealing with people and we start getting to a place like this. Well, you know what? Sin isn't even that bad. You know, you, we start having such compassion for the person that we forget that sin is still sin. And uh, with that being said, so okay, 
you know, this is a problem that isn't going to go away. This is a problem we're going to deal with in the church for, for many moons more to come. And um, hopefully we'll be able to curb it in, in, you know, 50, 60 years. But you have to understand this is not going to be like a rush in and conquer. You know, it's like World War One is a great example of this. They went into the war thing that they were – it started in August. They thought they'd be done with it in December of that same year, 1914. It didn't end until four years later <laughs> in 1918, you know, and, and, and the end of 1918. So, I mean, it's kind of, kind of the same thing going on here. So now that I've said all those things, remember that when you're dealing with somebody who has is – showing, is showing an unhealthy mental pattern, regardless of whether we're talking about mental health or sexual – health this is um it is something that develops not from a healthy individual but somebody who's been greatly hurt so learn to look at people who have these um these sins that they're living in learn, learn to look at them as wounded individuals rather than pains in the butt for every, everybody who's a pain in the butt you'll find and, and and a sinner and all that stuff you'll find that behind all that is a wounded individual and you cannot rush the healing process, and you can't just fix them with by snapping your fingers. So now that we've talked about all that, we can move on to the three topics we're going to look at tonight. The first one is fear-driven theology, and this is actually one that I don't necessarily disagree. That I don't necessarily disagree with anything on this. Right. So let, let's let's go over it. Hell is used as a fear tactic to keep you in church or to keep you a Christian. Exploring other hell theology means you're denying God. Agreeing with what with agree with what we believe, or you can find another church. Doctrine is pushed over love. Your salvation can be lost and is dependent on your strict obedience. So similar to some of the things from last week, some of these are only wrong depending on what the attitude that they're set in. Like so, for instance, um, this first thing right here, or the second thing. I mean, agree with what we believe, or you can find another church. Well, a church has to have a united core of beliefs. See what I mean? But with that being said, so for instance, agree with us that Jesus is God, or you know, you can't be a member here. Okay, that that's reasonable. But I don't think that's really what they meant on that. I think it meant more like this: um, rap music is of the devil, and if you think anything less, you can just get out. People should be wearing men should be wearing three piece suits everywhere they go, even to bed. It's like, okay, <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Now, now for for the for the, we'll start at the beginning though. The hell is used as a fear tactic. Holy crap! Yes, this has caused so much trauma for so many people. Oh my gosh, so many, so much trauma. I talk to people from my generation all the time who have problems sleeping, um, daymares, um, panic attacks. Thinking about these things that have been instilled and ingrained into them as a child about, you know, you should be afraid. Be very afraid. Ah! It's like, oh, okay, I am. I am afraid. I swear. I swear I'm afraid. <laughs> and it's like that's not really the message of the gospel, and yet that was what was taught to us at a very young age. And, you know, the last generation doesn't get it. Why are these people so afraid all the time? And then the next generation doesn't get it. They're like... Hell isn't even real. <laughs> it's like, oh, so we're in, we're stuck in this like in between place of, you know, we know that hell's real, but then at the same time we're just scared to death, and it's just a very unhappy place to be in, <laughs> thanks to years of literally instilling that in us. And you know, the thing is, is Paul even wrote, you know, the the, the spirit isn't one of timidity and fear, and yet what did we learn as children? Timidity and fear. <laughs> it's like, well. <laughs> Anyways, um, hell and revelation, you know, that, ooh, boy, oh, boy. And the thing was, I was already a Christian, so they were, it's like they were they were preaching at me, but I didn't do anything wrong. But yet I still had to change something so they wouldn't go to hell. And I don't know, whatever. Um, now, as far as the second part of the sentence, exploring other hell theology. Now, what that means is rather than believing that hell is an actual place, other hell theology seeks to... Um, reinterpret traditional beliefs about hell so rather than helping a literal place it's more of just a place with the absence of god um and instead of it being eternal uh, eternal uh, uh, you know suffering it's just a, a eternal non-existence um which you can see kind of the new age emphasis there and how they've kind of taken from other things to kind of pad it what are you saying another one my dad has always said is that it's like a jail you get like a sentence. Yeah, and then and you then get out. You serve that but honestly, the Catholic the Catholics have been teaching that for a long my time. My dad grew up Catholic. 
Oh, well, well, there you go. Uh, <laughs> die, habits die hard, right? <laughs> um, anyways, so, you know, it, it's okay to seek answers, and we actually should seek answers. If you have something about the Bible you're curious about, seek away. Like, that. there's nothing wrong with that. But you'll find that there are some things, if you study the Bible, that becomes absolutely clear. Hell is a literal place, and it is not someplace you get out after so long of a period of time. It's, that's what the Bible teaches. Like, so the only way to get around this would be to deny the Bible. Which a lot of people have done, actually, and that's what modern – not modern, but uh, cont uh, is it contemporary? No. Um, yeah, I guess you could call it contemporary Christianity does this, is they, they, they take away the importance of the Bible. Jesus is not really God. He was just a person, and then um, you know we're all basically good. And, you know, a lot of different things like that, and and you can kind of just see the emphasis of New Age and um, some other religions that just kind of mixed in with it. Anyways, but seeking answers is a good thing. That's not a bad thing. Uh, denying the answers that God has given is denying God. Okay, so it says they're exploring other health theology means you're denying God. No, no, you know, seeking answers is, is totally a great a great process of, of maturing and growing as a person, as a, as a Christian, yes. But when you, den when you deny an answer that God has given, well, that would be denying God. If, Jesus, if God said, Jesus is the only way to heaven, and you said, I have another way. I'm not that bad of a person. Well, then you are denying God. He said something. You're denying it. You're denying God. That's actually – that actually is exactly what it is. Um, as a Christian, you can't follow your own path. This is something that, that modern Christianity wants to make it a thing where you just kind of get to choose what works for you, and that's not Christianity. Like, you don't have to be a Christian if you don't want to be. But don't call yourself a Christian and, and whatnot and, and say, I love Jesus, when you're denying his clear – teaching on something and saying, no, I don't have to believe that. I can follow my own path. You know, it's okay for me to be gay and a Christian. It's okay for you to struggle with homosexual feelings. That's okay. It's wrong for you to partake in homosexual sex. That is what the Bible clearly teaches. You can struggle till the day that you die. That's not the issue. He said don't have homosexual sex. It's a very simple concept. So anyways, you know, as a Christian, you cannot follow your own path. You, it, it's something where you have been bought with a price, and that means you cannot be your own boss. Now, with that being said, to deny historical Christianity and the Bible and still call yourself a Christian is just – it's just fake. That's not how – sorry. That's not how things are going to work. Just a minute. I uh, – oh my gosh. It did the thing with the mouse, Eli, where it's just gone. Go away. Okay, there we go. Um, if you aren't a Christian, then it really doesn't matter. You can believe whatever the heck you want. But don't call yourself a Christian and then deny historical Christianity, the Bible, you know, conscience, excuse me, uh, you know, all this different stuff. It's like that's not Christianity, <laughs> and that's the part I don't get about modern Christianity. They still want to call themselves Christians, but they don't want to act like Christians. They want to call themselves Christians. They don't want to believe what Christians believe, and it's like they want to make it what they want it to be, and it's like you can't do that with what Jesus said. You can't. <laughs> if Jesus is nothing more than an enlightened individual, then you really aren't a Christian anyways. Like, this is kind of a big issue here. So, um, But I will say this. This has been made into a bigger issue than it really is. And what I mean by that is ultimately our belief in hell is not what saves us. Our belief in Jesus saves us. Okay? Our opinions don't change what is. I can deny that hell exists. That doesn't mean that hell does exist. I just deluded myself. I can believe whatever I choose to believe, but our opinions don't change what is. But it is good to explore the scriptures for answers as a Christian. That's good. Um, I had something else I want to say about this. Let me see if it's down for the line. Um if you deny what Jesus and the apostles taught, you are denying Christianity. In fact, the apostles of the early church, you can read this in the New Testament, they said this. If you do not follow uh, our, our teachings, the, the teachings of the apostles, you will not be heard. You are to be excluded. So um, as far as the apostles were concerned, they did carry that weight. And to deny what the apostles taught was literally to be not one of the, not one of the Christians. So <laughs> I think we can summarize and saying, yes, it would be a denial of God. Um, so this is where where the message of Christianity is naturally offensive. We don't actually have to make it more offensive than it already is. Um, but our attitude will have an, an amazing impact and, and an effect on this. So a lot of times it's not what we say, it's, it's how we say it. 
Jesus is the way to life versus you're going to hell without Jesus. It's like, okay, okay, hold on. Let's maybe cool it. <laughs> cool it. <laughs> Take it down a notch. Um, it's common for people nowadays to want, a, to want to have a relationship with God or call themselves Christians and be blessed but deny Christian t teachings. Like, like um, a, a big thing that, that Christians teach is that you go to church. But that's not what modern Christianity says. It says, hey, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. It's like, um, okay. So, I, you know, you have all these people who get out of church with a crappy little attitude, and then they say, well, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. It's like, you don't really know Christianity there, do you? And then they'll say they'll, they'll say things like, you know, oh, well, just because I don't go to your church doesn't mean that I that we can't be friends. And it's like, no, that's not what means we can't be friends. It's the part where you go and badmouth everybody to everybody else and gossip and can't keep your mouth shut. That's the part where it turns into something else. But anyways, uh, you know, I just that's not me. <laughs> so, you know, modern-day Christians argue and fight over most everything, even when it doesn't matter. And um, if I don't believe in hell, I won't tell people. Now, here, here's some, this is what I wanted to say. And here, here are the notes right here. Um. So let me, let me break this down into thoughts. The first thought, Christians argue and fight over most everything, even when it doesn't matter. There's a lot of things where we as Christians have allowed, allowed ourselves to be uh, have disunity about things that really aren't the biggest issues. And I'll give you one right off the top of my head. Are we, are we pre predestined or not? If we are predestined, it does not matter because God has told us to go and witness to, to the nations. So regardless of whether I believe that whoever will be saved or will be saved or not, that doesn't matter. I still need to obey God and go and tell the people. Yes, <laughs> we would all agree on this, but yet we've made this big argument about predestination. Doesn't matter. Um, but then, then here's the second thought that I want to say here. If I don't believe in hell, there's going to be natural consequences of how I live. I won't tell people about Jesus, and evangelism won't be important to me because I don't really believe in hell anyways. They're, they're not going to a bad place. But if I do believe in hell, then I have motivation. And uh, that might seem not seem important, but Christians who don't believe in what Jesus actually taught, you find them start slacking off more and more, like in their walk, until it's more of just it's not it's like a dead religion. Mm -hmm. If I believe that the rapture is before the tribulation, does that matter? No. People argue about this all the time. The rapture is before the tribulation. The rapture is after the tribulation. Who cares? <laughs> well, no one were there. <laughs> like, it's not that big of an issue. Um, now, as far as this one right here where it says doctrine is pushed over love, this is done so much in the church. So much in the church. I grew up in churches that were just like this. In fact, I haven't actually been into a good church until the church that I'm currently at over the past couple of years. When I first got to this church, it was a mess. Um, it was just – it was not good. It was not good. The church before this, I was there for a number of years, and nothing I did seemed to ma make any difference. The church before that, you know, you keep trying to fight and fight and fight and try to try to fix it, and it's just it's just not not realistic. Um, people though are more important than ticking boxes. When somebody comes into the church, you have to accept the fact that they're not going to know all the rules. They're not going to do everything right. They're not going to live just like Jesus. That's the part of reaching the lost. Rules are not as important as love. Jesus had a lot of things to say about this. And you know the thing is, Jesus came before people had their act together. And still, 2,000 years later, the church still doesn't have its act together. So which one is more important? Ticking all the boxes? This is what I've noticed. The churches that I've gone to where they have all these doctrines and dogma that you have to remember and all this stuff, you have to dress a certain way and act a certain way and all this different stuff, they usually tend to overlook the things like witnessing to people our church is clean we don't let any kids come in here and draw on the walls but you're not really reaching out to people but we know the bible backwards and forwards but you're not really loving people but we see what i mean like they have they're real good on all these things that they can mar mark off and look at how good we are and everything it's like but you're failing on the foundational thing. The Pharisees were not were, – were, they were – here's the thing that people don't get about the Pharisees. The Pharisees believed, believed almost the exact same thing as Jesus. They had almost the exact same beliefs. That wasn't the issue, and the Pharisees were really, really good at, at following those beliefs. They did that very well. They were not living in sin, but they didn't love people, and then they were living in sin. See the difference there? 
There's, it's like Frankenstein, right? Uh, you know, realizing that Frankenstein isn't the monster, it's the doctor, but then when you realize he is the monster, see what I mean? It's kind of like that same idea here. Oh, well, we're, we're not sinners. Oh. Oh, we're sinners. So, um, anyways, uh, so your salvation can be lost and is dependent on your strict obedience. Oh, boy, oh, boy. This... I've talked about many times. It's a very complicated issue, so let's say it in, bit, in bits. First off, salvation can be given away, not suddenly lost. It's not like you're you're walking down the street. Oh no, I lost my salvation! Come on. <laughs> it's not like a crucifix that you're carrying around your 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 um your neck here, and it falls off, and you're like, oh my god, my salvation's gone. Or if you've ever had a ring like this one that keeps always falling off all the time, you I lost my wedding band. Does that mean I'm no longer married? I mean, come on, <laughs> come on. Salvation can be given away, yes. How how do you how do you give it away? Well, you live in sin, and you don't decide that you, you that's where you want to be, and so the Holy Spirit tries to prompt you, and you don't go to God in repentance. You don't you're you're just living, and you're like, no, this is this is okay for me to do this sin that God warns me against, and I don't even feel guilty about it anymore. My conscience isn't bothering me. That's not a good thing. <laughs> that's called frying your conscience. <laughs> that's not a good thing. Were you about to say something? Uh, basically, you can walk you can walk away from it. You know, right. Just, uh, Right, um, right. You can give it away. Yes, that's exactly. Yes, exactly what I'm saying. Salvation can be given away by living in sin. If you are saved, um, oh yes. If you are saved, you will obey God. People think that I can be saved and not obey God. That's not how it works. So what happens is you're saved, right? And God will like bring something to you to deal with. Like, hey, you need to close your mouth and stop gossiping about everything. And I'm not going to do that. So then you hit a wall in your growth, and God's like, nope, we're not moving forward. So then you go to the next place, and try, and then God will speak to you, and you're like, oh, boy, this is great. And then God brings it back up, and he says, I'm not letting this go. You, you need to stop causing problems everywhere you go. And so then, well, I'm not going to do that. So we go somewhere else. And see what I mean? And we, the, the process follows us along, and we keep us with us the whole time. Um, and the thing is, if you are saved, you will obey God. It's the natural result of it. He is God, not you. Without obedience, there is no faith. That's the terms and conditions. It's not a threat. It's the terms and conditions. And God said that, not men. So this is something that's kind of important. If you have a church that is is saying something along the lines of this, where they're trying to make it where they are revoking your salvation from you, that would be men talking, not God. Good example. Um, if... You feel like you're not good enough to earn salvation, and then you go to a church, and the church tells you, "Yes, you're not good enough. You're not good enough to be here." It's like, well, that would be men speaking. However, with that being said, no, you aren't good enough to be saved. It's a free gift of grace, not something you earn. <laughs> so, okay. Um, now, as far as this, though, I've noticed that a lot of people have gotten saved to an idea, or a pastor, or a political party. Not the actual Jesus. So they'll go to church for years. It's just that they never really actually got saved to Jesus. They're not really in love with Jesus. They're in love with that pastor. That pastor dies, there's no pastor like him in the whole world. You know, they live out back in the golden days. Um, you know, they, they get saved to a political party like um, Republicanism. And they think that the American church, which historically has been Republican, uh, that's to be Christian. And so it becomes it could becomes a problem insurmountable if we have a Democrat president, if we have somebody in the church who's a Democrat or something. Oh, no, they're not saved. It's like, okay, let's wind that back a little bit there. That See, and that's what happens when you get saved to an idea rather than to Jesus, a political entity rather than Jesus. And the problem is that this last, the last generation, they made a pattern of this. You had to be Republican to be in our church. You know what I mean? Like you had to vote. Reagan had to be the best president in the world, hands down. You had to hate Barack Obama and uh, – or Osama. If you if you were a really good Christian, you'd call him Osama. <laughs> and, uh, you, you know, uh, Trump was the second Jesus. And uh, it's like, okay, okay, all right. That's not the gospel. And so they were unable to come to terms with one another if they had disagreement. If there was a Democrat in the church, right? Like, so here's a good example. That thing that happened a few years ago with the should we kneel or not kneel for the national anthem, right? Christians not letting certain people into the church if they didn't agree with them with that. See what I mean? Okay, here's the thing. We live in the land of the free. <laughs> you don't want to kneel. 
I, I think it's disrespectful, but I mean, whatever. It, it has nothing to do with God or the message of the gospel at all. And I don't think it should have any place in the church. Or when church is start putting American flags up, you know, in, in the front, it's like, okay, <laughs> this has nothing to do with God. And, uh, you know, so they get saved to an idea or political thing rather than to Jesus. And so when the gospel is preached in the church, they reject it because it's not what they use, what used to happen. They, we didn't used to do it like this. And so rather than being willing to try new things to reach people, they have to keep the church in a certain age, right? When I was 50 years ago, this is how we did it. We have, So we have to keep doing it like that. But if we do this, we can reach all these people. doesn't matter. You're not staying faithful to the gospel. No, you're not actually saved to the gospel. You're saved to 50 years ago. You're saved to, a, to an era. You're saved to the 1950s. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? And that, that's, that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about here. They drop out because they were never really one of the church, and trying to cater to them was fruitless. So with that being said, be, be loving and genuine, but don't compromise the truth of the message. There is only one way to heaven, and it's Jesus Christ. And this is not something that should cause us to be in fear all the time about hell. You, it's not, it's not the, the fear that led us to salvation, but the love. And it, it, Romans even says this, God gave us his kindness as a way of trying to get us Trying to reach us. So anyways, um, the next one, destiny or bust. We spent a long time talking about this earlier in the year. You guys remember that? Finding God's will. We spent like five weeks about this. Being told you have one destiny. Giving up good for God's best. Overanalyzing decisions with mentors. Or being afraid to make decisions because you've been told you have one destiny. Being so scared that you might miss you know, your, your, your perfect path that, that ah, 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 ah. And so you, you question making any decision and you just get into choice paralysis. Uh, being told you'll miss out on God's will for your life based on your wrong decisions. Missing God's voice because you didn't listen close enough. Always looking for these signs to... to, to, to and second guessing yourself and looking for signs to verify your direction in life. Oh my goodness. So we looked at finding God's will earlier this year. And if you guys are still having problems with this, go back and listen to those again. It's available on my YouTube. It's available on the Yams uh, Facebook. Uh, for real, guys, th this this shouldn't even be a thing. This is from insecure people pushing their insecurity on other people. Um, it, it's more important that you don't live in sin and you're thankful in whatever situation you are. What job should you have? Find a job that you can do and then do it. That simple. Your job doesn't have to be your life. It, and who should I marry? Who should, you know, find God's will for Here's the thing. It's okay to not marry. It's okay to not be married. If you fall in love with someone who's a Christian, hey, go for it. You're, it's, it's fine. Like it's, it's, it's not that big of a deal. But I would warn people who are not married, really make sure you want to wear, mar marry the person because the, the things that irritate you now will be huge, huge later. <laughs> Huge. Um, so choice paralysis is a real thing that, that holds many Christians just completely captive. You won't sleep well. You live in a constant fear of making any choice. You second guess everything. A couple years later, you go back and say, I shouldn't have done that. Or I shouldn't have done that. It's just a terrible – yes, this is absolutely a thing. It, it, I can't believe it's been so dominant in the church. Now, I will say this. You can miss out on things by disobeying God. Certain blessings you can miss out on. Okay, um, there's a lot of gossips, for instance, that miss what God was doing and didn't even know that they missed it. They weren't a part of really encountering God in a powerful way because they were too busy gossiping. Did they miss God's destiny? Why? Well, I know that it wasn't God's will for them to gossip, but we need to get 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 past this idea of God's will being this one door that we had to find and open. We need to get past that. Um. Israel missed out on the promised land because of their gossiping and complaining. Yep. Um, here's the thing about predestination, okay? If your life is predestined, it doesn't matter what you do, it'll happen. Or what will happen is already guaranteed off of what you were destined to do. Makes sense, doesn't it? I'll say it another way. You don't have to worry about finding your predestined purpose unless life is predestined, in which case you don't have to worry about it because it's predestined. So in other words, if your life is predestined, you're going to you're gonna stumble into that way anyways. Nothing you do will change that. So you don't have to worry about it. And if life is not predestined, then you don't have to worry about stumbling in or out of your predestined will because you're not predestined. Make sense? 
<laughs> it's a very simple concept, but people want to say, I don't believe in predestination, but I believe I can miss God's one will for my life, that magical door, and it's like, so you believe in predestination. <laughs> So either you can't have both, and if you do believe in predestination and there is one predestined path for you, then you are predestined to take that path. Or you're predestined to miss that path, in which case there's nothing you can do about it. So either way, whichever way it goes, don't worry about it. That's what it comes down to. If you're predestined to it, you'll find your way. Don't worry about it. If you're not predestined, eh, you can't make the you, you, you can't miss that one door, so don't worry about it. It's a win either way. But uh, there are better decisions and worse decisions. For instance, marrying somebody who is a pain in the butt that will haunt you for the rest of your life. And uh, contrary to popular belief, d divorce doesn't fix the problem. It I introduces new problems. And it ensures that you won't have victory in that area. So it's the thing that constantly haunts you for the rest of your life. I would know. I've talked to a lot of divorced people. I've never encountered a divorced person who did not have these ghosts that whisper in the back of their heads. If I would have done this, or if I should have done this, or all these different things, and they second-guess themselves. And If you don't believe me, look at the statistics. Statistically speaking, people who have been divorced do not have um, happy marriages in their second go and whatnot, and it just reduces more and more. It's possible, but there's a lot of trash to come over. And just something baggage that's you know there's a lot of baggage to get over anyways you don't have to worry about finding your predestined purpose unless like okay i already said that i think um no i didn't you don't have to worry about finding your predestined purpose unless life is predestined in which case you don't have to worry about it i did say that you don't have to be paranoid about doing everything perfect okay here's another thing i i forgot to mention this don't you don't have to be paranoid about doing everything perfect all the time your life is not about perfection it's about experience okay so you're going to make mistakes in your life, and that's okay because those mistakes will help you in your future to make other experiences and other memories. Okay, Life is a series of experiences all the time, and you can't look at them in, in, a, in a binary lens. Okay, So either there's a correct experience or an incorrect experience. It's not like that. There's all these possible correct experiences, and then there's sin, which is an incorrect experience. But... Just if you're not sinning and you're putting God first, and there's all these different things that I'm right now, I'm, I'm working as a pastor in Tularosa. Could I move if I wanted to? Yes. Could I change my vocation? Yes. In fact, I'm actually working on it. Within the next 10 years, I will probably not be a pastor after, the, after about 10 years. I'm going back to grad school and kind of just trying to open doors. You know, I want to try some other things. Since I'm almost dead at 30. <laughs> Anyways, um, but you don't have to be paranoid about doing everything perfect all the time. You're going to make mistakes. Life is not about not making mistakes, so don't worry about it. Um, it life is not like an exit for a highway where you, you got to keep your eyes open so you don't accidentally miss that one thing and ruin your whole life. But you should use your brain and try different things. So th that's two parts. First off, use your brain. Okay. Should I get involved in this illegal sca scandal? Hmm, no. Use your brain. But then the second part of that, try different things. Don't just say, hey, this is the one thing that I can do. I, I'm not going to do anything else. A good example of this is Chuck, right? So he knew he was going to be a youth pastor. He wanted to be a, work, a youth pastor, and he kind of focused all of his attention on that. But then over the past like five years, I, I, I guess it would be, he kind of realized that, that just because he's do doing the youth pastor thing doesn't mean that that's all he can do. So he started a thing on YouTube where he's going, where he helps helps Christians with like apologetics and stuff. He um, does this thing at the library where he teaches elderly people how to use technology. You know, he has all, he has these other things now. Is he still a youth pastor? Yes. Is he faithful to? His, yes. That's fine. I mean, that, that's fine. But that doesn't mean that that's the one thing. Yeah. Ah, I got to do this one. Ah. Yeah. So use your brain and try different things. Time does move fast. You're going to grow older faster than you think that you will. So you don't want to waste too much of your time sitting in front of, like, for instance, the TV all day. Go chase your dreams. I mean, if you fail at them, okay, well, at least you tried. But to live in regret is a certain kind of hell that is very difficult to break out of. And the last thing we're going to talk about tonight, service abuse. Not given a fair wage if you are on staff, saying it's a service to God. Very common in the church world. Guilting you into volunteering and that it's your moral obligation to the church. Very common in the church world. 
Church staff only having a relationship with you to ensure you keep serving. If you stop serving, that's the only time they reach out relationally. Extremely common. Extremely common. If you guys only realized how common that one was. So let's let's go through these kind of quickly. Volunteering is good, and definitely it shows maturity. Not that you should do it if you're trying to be mature, but as you grow and mature in Christ, volunteering is just something that's going to naturally happen. Um, but it shouldn't be forced, and it shouldn't be manipulated. So forced is where somebody doesn't necessarily make you. You will do this, but they strongly pressure you into it. And then you'll always, even if it was, even if you would have enjoyed doing it otherwise, you will harbor resentment towards them for doing it if you are pressured into doing it every time. It's best if you just make the decision yourself. And I wish more leaders knew this, that it would be better for people to come to the decision themselves. Give them the opportunity. Hey, we need helpers for this. If you don't want to, that's fine. And then it works out better. Nine out of ten times. Um, and it definitely shouldn't be manipulated. Now, this is where, you know, you, you try and make somebody feel like they're just a really bad person if they don't. So you're not really forcing and pressuring them like in – maybe we can find someone else to be a children's church leader if you don't want to volunteer for this. See what I mean? That would be pressuring. But manipulating is where you're like – you know, you, you try and make it you, – you toy with their emotions. You know, think about, think about all the kids that you're letting down. Yeah. You know, it's like, whoa, <laughs> this got real. Let's take a step back. Um, so, you know, it is in your best interest to to volunteer for stuff and to get involved. Um, it is in your best interest. You know, it'll help you to grow and mature and that kind of stuff. Not that you should do it to grow and mature, but it will help you grow and mature. In other words, what I'm saying is this. If you are not a mature Christian, you're thinking, hmm, what can I do to mature? Volunteering is probably not what you should go to first. Because you'll probably overwhelm yourself. Right. But when you do finally take the step of volunteering, you'll find yourself growing in ways that you didn't before. I think I've explained that as well as I can. Um, some people see other people as nothing more than positives or negatives. Either they are you know, somebody that they can exploit or somebody that they don't get any use from. And that's not a good place to be in. Uh, they don't always necessarily mean to do that, but they get so busy that they only focus on the problems. I'm not saying that that's fair because that's definitely not fair, you know, um, when you're only paying attention to people, you know, when they're not doing what you want them to do and stuff. That's that's not fair. But sometimes you accidentally fall into those things when you're a leader. You don't mean to. You just do. Um, and here's the bad thing about that. It, it wears them out. You know, if because you're not really there to strengthen them, you're there to use them. So it wears them out. And it'll wear you out too, and it'll kind of wear out the people that are involved because they're going to feel like the tension in it. And uh, it seems like they don't care. It seems like the leaders don't care, and you know it, it wears them out because they're chasing people who are already – who are because of their extreme exhaustion, they're already making problems. So they're like chasing these people, putting out fires all the time. And so it, wear, it wears the leaders out too, and you know it, it makes the leaders seem like they don't care, like they're just kind of jackasses, and that's – you know. It's all unfortunate, but it's something that's very easy to stumble into. Um, it's not wrong to check on somebody who's dropping off. You know, if you know somebody who, who was in a ministry and they're and they're backing off, it's not wrong to check on people who are doing that. But here's the thing: you should have a relationship with them that you are building with no ulterior motives. Let's say, for instance, um, Nicole is in charge of the food pantry. Now, I should have a relationship of some sort with Nicole. Yes. As as a as a church member, right? Okay, awesome. But and if she starts dropping off of the food pantry, not doing her job correctly, kind of not really seeming interested, maybe pulling back from services, that kind of stuff, I should talk to her and see if she's okay. And that's definitely not wrong to check in on people. But my relationship with Nicole shouldn't be for an ulterior motive of using her to do this thing. I want to get this thing done. Who can I use for it? See what I mean? That that shouldn't be the place. Christians should be – the relationship of, of Christians among themselves should be one of family members helping one another. Not, not employer and employee. Well, in, in a way, you can't help that when you get to the higher level stuff like um, associate pastors to the senior pastors. But at a, at a more general level, yes, I, 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 totally, I totally agree. Um, 
So the sign of getting into a spiritual rut, you stop going to services, you, you stop volunteering, you complain about everything, and, you know, everybody starts irritating you. People become irritations, not really, you know, people anymore. You're just like, ugh, I have to deal with Isaiah again. Or, so, I mean, it just got, it's, it's just, you get into this place of a spiritual rut, and everything goes downhill. Your whole life, you know, uh, not, not your whole life isn't like your, <laughs> your work is going to fail. No, you can be uh, spiritually stagnant and do excellent at your job. That's not what I mean. I mean, it, it affects everything in your life. You know, you start being more complaining. You know, life doesn't seem as, as good as it did before. Um, people just irritate you. You don't really see the opportunity and joy of Christ. You see the stupidity of people. You know what I mean? It, it's just, it's just a subtle little change that happens when you're in a spiritual rut. It affects how your outlook on things is what I'm trying to say. So um, this is absolutely a thing that happened. If you notice, a lot of these things that we're looking at with these religious abuses, they're things that really do happen. My my, my generation has a genuine complaint that is for real. You know, service abuse. Yes, I've known this many times where pastors even are expected not to get paid because you know um, you know for whatever reason it's like no that that's not acceptable. Paul even talks about this. Somebody does the time. They should, you know, they should get paid for that. Uh, destiny or bust. This is a very real thing. Christians, you know, e equipping people with fear. Here, here's another thing. Fear-driven theology. This is a thing that these things really are real. You know, people with mental abuse. We looked at this last week. Yes, they are not understood and rejected in the church. People with, with, with you know, having a hard time with their sexuality. Yes, that is a thing. Um that the church has failed at in the years past, and it's not going to be something we can just instantly fix. Like I said, my generation doesn't really want to just get back in church. They don't see the point of going to church. They don't understand why it's any use. They don't think that any churches are different, and even if there was a church that was different, they've already tried four or five different churches at this point. They're tired and sick of it. It's not going to be something that you can just laugh off or give a simple solution for. And Oh my goodness, God forbid that anybody actually try and get them to go to church. <laughs> boy, oh boy. And I'm, I'm not saying they're right, I'm, but I'm saying that you know when somebody is going through a situation like that where they obviously have trauma from the past, here's the thing. I would understand if I wasn't me and I, like, I was somebody else and I saw me who wouldn't really be me. It would be somebody else. <laughs> okay, I tried to say that in a funny way, but okay. Nicole's not having it tonight. She's like, no. <laughs> um, but if, if, if I saw someone like me out of church, I would understand why. You know, growing up with, with fear embedded, and the church was a place of fear, not of love and acceptance. You know, um, when I started having panic attacks and anxiety and that kind of stuff, the church wasn't a place for me to find healing. It was a place for me to hide the truth from because I'd just be judged for it. Um you know, and if I did have fear, that was just proof of the evil and, you know, the sin I was living in or something, you know. And uh, the, the different things, destiny. Yes, you do have to be terrified and terrified of taking any steps because you might make the wrong one. I mean, the I under, I would understand if someone like me wasn't in, wasn't in church. I would get it. And I wouldn't even judge a person for it. I think that it's a bad move, but I understand the move. You know, you can't you can't run from problems. And uh, when you get in the rut of running, of running from problems, it just makes things worse. Getting out of church is a big mistake. Um, you know, trying to pick and choose your own theology and then be happy, it doesn't work. You know, but with that being said, I understand. It's something that I am still here because I was raised about faithfulness because I didn't have too much of an opportunity to get out of church with my dad being a pastor. <laughs> And uh, because my mom and dad did give me a foundation that has lasted through the storms that I've had to go through. What happens if now, I talked about earlier at the beginning of the lesson, the, the generation that doesn't have fathers. So now take away that firm foundation. Yes, I understand why they're not in church anymore. I, I get it. I understand. They're, unfortunately, there's, we don't get a second do with those people. But we can... Um, decide what to do with the people that we do have. And so we'll look more about this over the next couple weeks. Um, next week will not be continuing. And I know it says next week religious abuse. That is a lie. First off, it will be a party. Second off, it's not part two. It will be part three. So we will go to part three in two weeks. <laughs> Any questions?
more like a comic. Okay, go ahead. When you were using the example of building a relationship with somebody in the church mm-hmm. and to not be using that basically to your advantage, a lot of things I've seen over pretty much the whole time I've grown up in church is people also use it to get to stick their nose into other people's lives. Ooh, yes. More, it happens so much, and I never... Yes. It, it didn't occur to me until you said that. I was like, oh... That's and, what I've been seeing. And honestly, Nicole, that's such an ugly thing. And yes, I'm so glad that you said that because yes. I mean, there's nothing else to say. I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I, I've known that all throughout my Christian life. You know, oh, let's be friends so I can get all the juicy gossip and so I can talk behind your back. And oh, by the way, did you hear what they were doing behind your back? And it's like... Oh, yes. Yes. Also with the feeling guilty thing, I noticed a lot of things of, like, if you're in leadership and someone else is in leadership, um, it's more like a, a, hey, I helped you with your thing, so you have to help me with my thing because I helped you with your thing. Okay, I think I know what you mean. Correct me if I'm wrong. You're saying, okay, I'm helping you with your ministry or with your event, mm -hmm. so now I expect you to come to my event and to help me with my right. event. Okay. Kind of like owing you, almost. Yeah. Like I only, scratched your back, you scratched mine. They're only yeah. helping you to get your help. Ah. Yeah. Ah. I better go to this, even though I don't want to, so that they'll have to help me. Yeah. Or, let me give you this, so that way you'll help me with this later. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Anything else? Um... Well, I just want to bring up again, you talked about how um, the church tends to, like, it, it's done a lot, it's done the LGBTQ plus community pretty badly, pretty wrong, and uh, I watched this video um, where this guy was coming out to a bunch of churches and stuff. Oh no, it's going to be bad, isn't it? All of their answers to this guy were absolutely horrible, like, just... They either like condemned him, or they just didn't give a very um, precise or good answer as to you know to his question. Yeah, a lot of ways. A lot of times you'll see um, people from churches or like uh, a church community or something like that uh, deal stuff with like the, the the wrong way. Like they'll say it like absolutely horribly. It's like you know, it's how you drive people away from the <laughs> church. It's not that. That's not how you yeah. lead them in. It's how you push them away. Yeah. yeah. It's like it's like this. Well, here in America, we're Christian, and we say the truth. And so I don't have to say things the smart way. It's your fault. It's like, um, okay. I didn't know knowing Jesus gave me a free pass to be a jackass. That's uh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Wish I had known that before. <laughs> so, something I, I've, I've come to realize, too, I don't know if it counts as religious use or not, but, um, People that um, know they'll be called out in service tend to not go to church very often because they don't want to be called out. Like, oh, look, hey. Person. Do you mean called out during the service? Yeah. Like the pastor I, looks at them and says, yeah. you sinner. Either that or they're like, hey, someone's new here. Stand up. Or oh my um, they're gosh. afraid to go to the <laughs> altar because they know the, the, the. People are judging them for people going. People are judging them or they know the pastor and they're like, oh, now the pastor's going to talk to me afterwards. And mm. Or they'll make it like really obvious, like they'll be talking about you and then they'll like look at you and be like, oh. During, during yeah. the service. The Lord <laughs> told me some of the things that you guys have been doing and I've been to services like that. <laughs> where they're, like, staring, they're staring you down. And they're like, like those movies you guys have been watching are not good. You need to get rid of those. Yeah, I've seen and everybody in the black hair, blue jeans, red shirt. The service knows who they're talking about. Like, oh my, they've been watching something dirty. <laughs> and some of them I've seen where they're scared that they're going to be called out by the spirit. They're like. <laughs> Now, now, can you elaborate on that? Do you mean like where just, God convicts them? Right. Or oh, okay. Like they're just they're so scared of it that they just stop going to church. Because mm. like they know they're doing wrong, they just hate being told that they're doing wrong. You know, actually, I, I've I've experienced a lot of that, mm. a lot of that. Um, and th that one isn't really something you can resolve though, because it's like <laughs> that's between you and God. What do you mean to do? But I have noticed on the flip side of this. I have noticed people who know better, who've been in the church for a long time, 
been saved for years, 50, 60 years. And they don't go to church because they don't want to change. You know, um, there were actually some people that we that we asked to leave. And, uh, you know, the way that they would specifically go to church, go to service or not go to church, not go to service based on, you know, the leverage that they would have in the service. You know, it's just like, that's a little excessive. <laughs> but anyways, um, okay. So any other great comments, guys? Really great comments. Anything else?